this event. Uh, you do pay some money, and um, it, it, there is some money that comes in that is more than what I have to pay out, and that money every year has not gone to the World Rainforest Fund. This year actually is a little different. A small portion will go to the World Rainforest Fund is to promote saving the earth and the environment, because that's part of the theme, and to present you with a program of integrity so that we do this with as much as we can, zero environmental impact. We have it near BART. We have the reception as much as we can, organic food, and try to use email and avoid print and stuff. So there is your purpose. Thank you again for coming, and uh, we'll have a two-minute break, and then we will resume the program. Roger. Sponsor of Darwin Day. He's also a financial contributor to the World Rainforest Fund, of which Dave Seabor is the president and the founder. Rajan owns the Taste of the Himalayas restaurant in Berkeley, which has a karma kitchen once a month. This tomorrow. We'll have it tomorrow. Maybe yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. And this is a creative idea in which people eat for free, but then have the option of volunteering to pay for the next person's meal. <laughs> he funds a school in his native Nepal for students. This prevents children from being tempted into becoming sex slaves. He supports East Bay schools in raising money for education from elementary to high school, and that includes Berkeley High. <laughs> he is a fiscal sponsor of a program that works with UC Berkeley that funds students in India. He will introduce today's Darwin Day. Uh, I am Rajan Thapa. I live in Berkeley. And then I try to involve myself and get connected to with community activities. Uh, we came to Berkeley in 2003. We had no idea what we were going to do. I'm a teacher. I founded a school in Nepal for the girls. I, I, did, I, I did that in 1993, and then I taught in university for 17 years. Uh, due to political situation and so many problems that took place in Nepal, we had to leave the country uh, so that I could sustain that school which I had founded. So we came with my son. He was in the seventh grade. He was taking the photograph. My daughter, she was in the 10th grade, we got them admitted in Berkeley High, and then I started working in the restaurant that used to be called Curry Club, and then after working there for eight months, I asked the owner, uh, I want to buy this restaurant, and then I had no money. <laughs> <laughs> New immigrant, just coming from Nepal, and Nepal is second poorest country in the world next to one country, and then we are not even allowed to bring money here. You have to have valid U.S. visa, and then you can bring $2,000. So we come from that country. So you can imagine we didn't have any money when we came in here. And then when I asked him, the owner, for who I was working, he said, okay, I'll give you $140,000. Oh, wow. And okay, give me three days time. I, I had known two people. I called one person. He said, uh, I was a known figure in Nepal, so they had, they had known me before, so they used to respect me as a professor, <coughs> as a teacher, as a founder of the school. And he said, I, ha I only have $80,000. I said, I need $140,000. And I called the next person. He said, okay, tomorrow, 9 o'clock, I'll give $140,000. That's how I bought that restaurant and changed the name, and the name of the restaurant right now is Taste of the Himalayas. It's 1700 shares. North Berkeley, 
Golden Carol. Uh, but I'm not promoting my restaurant here. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. Uh, I'm very happy to sponsor this event. I know David Shivor. He has been a wonderful friend of mine. Last year also I sponsored the event. We had a beautiful uh, program uh, in Art House Gallery in Berkeley. Uh, I, being a student of science, I always love Darwin. So today is. Charles Darwin's birthday. We are here to celebrate science. <coughs> Thank you for coming in here. And uh, we'll have a wonderful speech by our Dr. William Morner, a Nobel Prize winner. In, uh, in, <coughs> we read him, we heard him, and he's right here. <laughs> so we are very happy, very fortunate to be able to listen to him, uh, sit near him, take photographs with him, enjoy the day with him. Uh, and then David Schubert, biologist who has been dedicating his whole life to the world and forest. <laughs> so uh, it's a beautiful day. We are here. Let's celebrate. Let's have fun. Let's listen. Let's talk and then have a nice deliberation so that we can somehow contribute <laughs> to the world and forest, to, to science and then to the community. And once again, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to me. And then I uh, hope to have a wonderful time here together. Thank you. That the genetic code is not optimal. He's working on a book on his so-called Pachamama theory that states that organisms have made the earth better for life by creating oxygen high in the atmosphere, making the soil, and burying the greenhouse gases, thus regulating Earth's climate. The theory also posits that symbiosis is much more important than it is recognized. It structures ecosystems and evolution. He's president of the World Rainforest Fund. It's a nonprofit organization, tax exempt. Its purpose is to sa save the Earth's rainforests by empowering indigenous people. This fund likely set the record for species saved per dollar when it saved the world's most biodiverse ecosystem, a 10,000 acre rainforest in Ecuador. In, and it only costs $3,500 for 10,000 acres. David organizes a symposium, he organized a symposium of Nobel Prize winners on the environment. It was at the 100th anniversary of the Nobel Prize in Sweden in 2001. He carried the Ten Commandments for the Earth down Mount Sinai on a camel. <laughs> that is, yes, that is the same mountain, same mountain that Moses allegedly carried down the original Ten Commandments. <laughs> he wrote a successful poetry book. It's called Honor Thy Selber. He has a couple here today. He's been an organizer of Darwin Day for the last three years and has been impersonating Charles Darwin for the last 20 years. <laughs> With impunity. <laughs> How long have you had those whiskers? An hour. <laughs> Today, he's going to give us a lecture as Charles Darwin. And he'll show his exotic reptiles and his fossils, read some from his poetry, and do a few other things of interest. And before I'm Darwin, uh, let me remain David Seaborg, even though so dressed. 
Chris <laughs> Darwin to handle just a couple of items. The first one is acknowledgments. This does not happen just by me. I'm the organizer, but it needs the help of my friends. Rajan Thapa, the sponsor, our Nobel Prize winning speaker, and his lovely light wife Sharon, W. Murner, not Murner, Murner, and Sharon. And Bill Ryan, the moderator, of course. And uh, assistants with help with registration and taking care of moving things around and getting organized, Jim Doyle, Reed Stewart, and my lovely wife, Adele Seaborg, who's probably now, yeah, is waiting at the table registering people. And, uh, of course, Ron Scrivani and the company who are renting us this place today. Um, the next thing I want to do is make a little acknowledgement because we did lose some of us who are here, including myself, a Nobel Prize winning friend who was uh, a friend of my family's, my father's and mine, and some of the other people here today who lived to be the ripe old age of uh, 99, uh, invented the laser and the laser, Charles Towns. Mm -hmm. So I would like to acknowledge Charles because he passed away just in the last couple of weeks. The statement that without the raven, the bird, the raven, there would be no dog. Such is the interrelationship of species and evolution. So how can I justify that statement? The raven has a symbiotic relationship with the wolf. Now, let me kind of make clear the definition of symbiosis so we can proceed from there. Symbiosis can mean two species, different species, each which helps the other. However, the more modern definition today is there are three forms of symbiosis. One, in, in each of the three, one species is helped by the other. In uh, mutualism, the species that is helped helps back. So there's two species help each other. So it's the old same as the old definition of symbiosis. In commensalism, one species helps the other, the other does not affect the first species. So an example of mutualism would be a bee pollinating a flower where the bee gets the nectar, but the bee services the flower by moving its pollen from one flower to another, and since the pollen has the male, part of the flower, the sperm, it allows the flower, which cannot walk around, to reproduce. Commensalism, an example, would be a hermit crab when looking down. And it flies around and signals the wolf just by hovering over the prey, and the wolf has learned to pick this signal up. So the wolf then goes to the prey and is led to it, and hopefully, not always, but sometimes succeeds in making the kill. Other times, the raven more easily finds the carcass, and if it can access the carcass, it doesn't kill the wolf, but often it can't. The carcass is too hard and not open enough, in which case it circles around and signals the wolf to the carcass. The wolf comes to the carcass. So the wolf benefits by finding the prey more easily, using the raven's eyes. Wolves are social is because they can better form a team and kill the prey and get more prey. Well, it turns out a wrong wolf can take down a moose. It also turns out that scavengers take a lot of their kill, ravens up to a third of it, and wolves actually, according to scientific studies, actually lose more food per wolf because they have to share it with other wolves than they gain by eating it. And that's why most predators are solitary. Now, 
are selling their kids to work in harsh conditions. The rise of piracy and maritime violence in Somalia is connected to battles over fishing rights as fish stocks decline due to human overfishing, pollution, and climate change. What began as an effort to repel foreign vessels illegally trawling through Somali waters, then escalated into hijacking fishing, and then non-fishing vessels for ransom, piracy. That's how the Somali pirates got started. Competition for fish stocks led to the birth of Somali piracy, therefore. For Somali fishermen and for hundreds of millions of others, fish and wildlife were their only source of, of livelihood, so that when this is threatened by international fishing fleets, drastic measures were taken. So the authors of this study that I just referred to compared wildlife poaching to the drug trade, noting that huge profits from trafficking luxury wildlife goods, such as elephant tusks and rhino horns, have attracted guerrilla groups and crime syndicates worldwide. They pointed to the Lord's resistant army, Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram, as groups known to use wildlife poaching, poaching to fund terrorist acts and attacks. It had also been found that dwindling fish supplies in West Africa are linked to increased bushmeat honey and loss of wildlife. Not enough fish, you kill the bushmeat, the animals in the African forest. People no longer have enough fish to eat, so they must turn to meat from the jungle, including monkeys and chimpanzees for food. The regional bushmeat trade is over $400,000 per year in Africa alone. Without interventions, the collapse of both aquatic and terrestrial resources would likely result in widespread human poverty and food insecurity in the region. We must improve the livelihood of local join and support environmental organizations, recycle, use public transportation, buy organic food, and write for your representatives to save the earth, its wildlife, its people, all of which are interrelated. Thank you very much. Questions, but there will be opportunity for questions as well later. But questions now on this talk. Okay, do I see no questions? Okay, oh, okay. Uh, two things totally unrelated. I think, who uh, knows? One it seems to be the major transition in life from prokarya to eukarya had nothing to do with natural selection at all more to do with symbiosis if we're right. That's mm -hmm. number one. Number two, I don't see the titanic problem that we face of all these interrelated catastrophes. It's a systemic problem of the nature of the social system that we have in the world, the dominant social system, which is constantly warring, constantly intervening in other countries, constantly looking for a, a short-term profit. How are you going to solve this world problem with such a predatory type of socioeconomic system at the helm all over the world. Okay, first question. The transition that LSR referred to from prokaryotes, which are the simple cells that have no nucleus and their DNA is spread throughout the cell, which are, include bacteria, to the eukaryotes, which have the DNA in a nucleus and have a more complex cell, which include things like fish and humans and even unicellular things like paramecium and amoeba, because they have a more complex cell with the <coughs> nucleus. Uh, the, that transition, yes, it involved mutualism because the original bacterial cell was invaded by another bacteria, actually ingested it, but did not digest it. So the cell within the cell carried out respiration for the cell that was around it and was a parasite for it at first, but 
the cell that got the benefit of respiration from the other cell lost more and more of its ability to carry out respiration, breathing at the molecular level, and became more dependent on the cell within it, but that little cell within it doing the respiration lost its ability to survive on its own, and they became mutualistic, mutualism, symbiosis, until it became an organelle or part of the cell. So our mitochondria now, which carry out the respiration, breathing of our cells at the molecular level, are actually originally from other bacteria. Same story for the chloroplast, which carries out photosynthesis for plants. Ingestion, but no digestion. Evolution losing their own abilities, becoming more interdependent till they're mutualistic, till the chloroplast became an organelle or part of the plant cell. So yes, mutualism, but that does not mean it wasn't from natural selection. There was still natural selection, because they were benefiting from this mutualism. Second question has to do with the social system and the exploitation we have. And the answer is, you are quite right. We cannot go on exploiting people and the earth and expect not to have a crash of civilization. Therefore, we must institute not only education so people know to do better, but regulatory controls that are strictly enforced to not allow this uh, exploitation. And I know what you're driving at, and I agree with you that the system itself needs a change. Uh, needs to be actually not changed, but actually replaced. I agree with that. Okay, so are we ready for the animals? Sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. So where are the animals? Uh, Ron? In the back, look behind the curtains. I'm not Ron. Right. Have you got a lion back there? <laughs> so uh, I promised you fossils, and it appears that I didn't that they are in the, unfortunately, in my briefcase, which I forgot to put in the car. But you get more time with the animals, is the positive side. Secondly, <coughs> the fossils were mainly ammonites and trilobites, which you have either seen, or if you come to other of my events, you will get to see in him. The ammonite is the circular thing like the chambered nautilus. The trilobite is the main swimming invertebrate of the sea, the first major invertebrate. But uh, we'll just have to skip those this time. But you can get another chance. Both the trilobite and the ammonite live in the sea. This is a hognose snake. And um, is the restroom in use? In use. Okay, as soon as it's not in, actually, I think I'm all right here. I've got some. He pooped. I'm going to clean it up. Uh, western hognose snake. There are two species of hognose snake, the western and the eastern, in the U.S. Now, all snakes either have keeled or rough scales, in which case they have one keel on each scale on the back. And... All members of the same species are the same. Those with keeled scales all have the keel or ridge in the middle of each scale on the back, not on the belly. Those are smooth in all species. Other species have smooth scales with no keel. The hognose snake is keeled, rough scale. So notice when you touch it, the rough or the keel. The belly plates are long and smooth and not with foam. He is a pretty orange. This would never happen due to natural selection in the wild. It would be yellow. It is snake fanciers who bred it to be the pretty orange. 
He lives in the semi-arid, not full desert regions of Nevada, Utah, western U.S., not California. He has spots and he's gray, and hence he is very well camouflaged. That is his first line of defense. Should a predator find him, and he has many predators, skunks, hawks, eagles, coyotes, foxes, uh, raccoons, other snakes, he will put on a display. He's got stripes on the neck, and he'll put the neck out between the stripes and the inflation of the neck by air, the neck looks big. He is not mimicking a cobra because cobras don't live in the U.S. But he is mimicking a poisonous snake. He coils up like he's dangerous. He strikes, he hisses, and he acts generally mean. It's all <laughs> bluff. Complete bluff. Because this species has never in history been recorded to bite a human even once. Mm. Or even anything that it's not going to eat. They do not bite. This is the most totally, I mean, you know, when a guy says, oh, that dog doesn't bite, sometimes you can believe something to get, this is 100%. <laughs> <laughs> However, Sometimes this trick doesn't work. And believe me, I've been with snakes all my life, so I know snakes, and I am not afraid of snakes. This thing even startles me. He's so good at the act. It is startling. <laughs> it works. But sometimes it doesn't work. He has a third. So he kind of mimics the rattlesnake when he does that. His third trick, flip over on the back. Remember, it's not bright orange. It's just yellow. Wiggle around, open the mouth, let the tongue out, exude the smell of rotting meat. <laughs> play dead, play possum. Those are his tricks. He's called a hog nose snake because he's got a nose turned up like a hog or a pig, which allows him to look more deadly and mainly allows him to dig holes in the soil to get underground. This is good for him because this way he can regulate his temperature because underneath the ground it's a more stable temperature. If it's cold, it's warmer underground. If it's hot, it's cool. It's a thermal regulatory device. Generally in the wild these guys like to eat toads mainly toads, sometimes frogs, and little rodents. I feed him mice. He only has to eat once a week, except now when he's in hibernation. He's only out for the day, but normally in the winter. I hibernate him, and he doesn't eat. I just lower the temperature. I no longer feed his cage. Now, I don't like him to have to deal with live mice, so I feed him dead mice, and then there's no ratio of him being bitten. One disclaimer, I'm going to let you all hold him, touch him, whatever you want, but I am going to warn you, he is poisonous. He does have venom glands to help kill his prey. He is not a constrictor. But the poison is so mild that it's just to make the prey weaker. Bite your thumb, your thumb will get swollen. But what did I tell you about the history of these biting? Never, ever. So this way you get to say, hey, I held a poison snake. <laughs> the western hognose snake, if you don't want to hold it, just tell the person and have them pass it. If you want to touch it but not hold it, have the person take the head and hold it away so you can safely touch it. <laughs> Is it okay to take a picture? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Whatever you want. You know how many you came with, right? So you'll go home with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I keep track. There are four snakes and one tortoise. This oh. is a king snake. 
He is a Sonoran black kingsnake. Now, he is all black like this normally. This was not bred by pen fanciers. The California king snake is banded black and white and lives in the hills of the East Bay as well as other parts of California. And you've probably seen those. In Southern California, the California king snake has a form that's striped, so they vary. When an animal has different forms of the same subspecies, even in the same population, this is called polymorphism. The California king snake is polymorphic. However, this guy is a different subspecies. So this isn't polymorphism. This guy lives in southern Arizona and northern Mexico in the desert and is the same species as the California king snake, but a different subspecies. So they're both the common king snake. The banded or striped one that's polymorphic is the California king snake. This is the Sonoran black king snake. These are not poisonous. They are very powerful constrictors. Yes, Kyle. What does it mean to be a different subspecies? Okay, it means that you aren't different species, so you can interbreed. That's the definition of species and have viable reproductive offspring. But you are sufficiently different to be considered a subspecies. In this case, different range and different coloration. So, or you can have even less than subspecies, you can have different races as in the humans. So, he's a very powerful constrictor. Feel how strong he is compared to the hognose snake, which is not a constrictor. He um, is, uh, um, he will eat in the wild, I feed him dead mice, but he will eat any rodent, bird, lizard, and certain snakes, including rattlesnakes. Hmm. King snake means eats other snakes. He will eat rattlesnakes, which are poisonous, kill them by constriction, hmm. and is immune to the rattlesnake's body. Hmm. If a king snake comes to a rattlesnake, the king snake goes perpendicular to get it. The rattler goes parallel, so he can't be gotten, mm -hmm. and they play this game till the rattlesnake either gets away or gets eaten, and usually if they're that close, it's curtains for the rattlesnake. He is somewhat nervous. Be careful. If you are worried, uh, don't hold it. Now, how do you hold the snake? Give it plenty of support. Remain calm, because it knows. <laughs> and give it freedom of movement. Do not go by these textbook things where you grab the neck so it won't bite you. No, give it freedom of movement, support, and be calm. And you will be fine unless you are holding an individual that should not be held. Then just don't hold it. There are certain snakes even I won't hold. This is a corn snake. The corn snake doesn't look anything like this. This is a mutation. This is, the corn snake has what's called the red-green gene, which makes it, no, excuse me, red-yellow gene, which makes it red and yellow. And uh, this is an albino mutation that's missing a functional red-yellow gene. So normally it would be looking kind of uh, brown and some red and some yellow and quite pretty. But today this guy with the mutation is lacking the pretty gene and is a black colorless guy. And he is also a constrictor and he is also called a red rat snake, the gene to produce melanin. And uh, melatonin. Yeah. Remind me. The one that makes the pigment is melatonin. Melatonin. What? 
Melatonin helps you fall asleep. Melanin makes your skin darker. Do white people, Af Europeans, have any of that melanin in them? Yes, because we would be totally white with pink eyes if we were albinos. <laughs> African descent, you have the most because it protects from the sun. In Africa, if you evolve there, wow, lots of sun to damage the skin, you need it for protection. If you're evolved in Europe, you need to get your vitamin D from the sun. So you don't need as much protection. So it's all natural selection. So no melanin, he has a mutation. No black pigment makes him a very pretty color. Another corn snake also with smooth scales, loaf of bread shape, like all rat snakes, of which there are many species, and uh, an eater of rodents and a constrictor. We have recently found that, thank you, that many, many snakes once thought to be uh, non-poisonous are indeed poisonous. It turns out. Yes. What? So the snake, the um, you said you had one. Okay. So the uh, snake flicks the tongue out, and it's for to pick up chemicals in the air, which it smells not with the tongue. Brings the tongue in the mouth, puts it into two holes in the mouth, which are, is so sensitive to smell that it can smell as well as we humans can see. They tell the sex of other snakes, predators and prey with smell. Why do they have a forked tongue? Because it is two holes they put it in, in the mouth. Why are there two holes? It's the same reason we have two ears, two eyes, and two nostrils. So you can, with two, it's called parallax, you can judge distance and um, direction better. And the two holes that, with the whole apparatus that smells so well, is called the Jacobson's organ. Now, we used to think almost all snakes were non-poisonous. We have now had recent research where many of the poisonous species have mild poison. We don't know yet why they haven't evolved fangs or a delivery system with poison. It may just be that since poison evolved from saliva to better digest prey, it's just on its way and it's better digesting and subduing the prey. The rat snake's poison is an anticoagulant, so if it bites you, you will bleed more, your uh, blood won't be able to coagulate as well, so it's mildly poisonous, the garter's name is mildly poisonous. Okay, now, um, I am going to go on to the poetry, moving right along here. So, uh, So what we're going to do is we are going to um, have you each have a poetry book and read along. And why do I do this? Can you pass these to take a little time? And here you go. And, and uh, the reason... Uh, or you're not going to be in? <laughs> They're both albino, but I assume you're referring to the one who's amelanistic. A means not. So everyone's been able to, to hold the one that is, okay. 
the A xanthistic that lacks the pigment xanthanin, which is the red and yellow color. So um, let us just finish those up, if we may. Okay, anyone else for this snake? Okay, everyone's had a shot at the snake. I have a question. Yes. Yeah, now, does the behavior of these snakes, has it been modified because they're handled a lot by you or other yes. humans? Indeed, so yes. So a, a, a snake in the wild wouldn't allow you to... Depends on the snake and the no. species. Some species are naturally calmer, and within species, some individuals are naturally calmer. So if you pick a nasty individual of a nasty species from the wild, and you don't know how to hold snakes, it'll probably bite you. If, they, if they're nasty, but they've been tamed in health, they will tend not to bite, because it's genetics and their history together. Right. Anyone else who wants, if it's not held, so we're okay. Uh, and uh, for example, the Mojave rattlesnake. Let's bring him over for a close-up here, just is, before you put him is, away. The Mojave rattlesnake is a highly poisonous, quite pretty greenish, a uh, close relative of the western diamondback rattlesnake, which is much more poisonous and aggressive than the closely related western diamondback rattlesnake. So if you run into a Mojave rattlesnake, which I have because I go out hunting for snakes and I wanted to because I wanted to see one, they will immediately rattle and if you go up and think that you're going to have a game with it, you can get bitten and get very sick and or die. Uh, so the snake is very, very valuable to ecosystems because why? Because why? Yes, they eat and control rodents, uh, and some of them control uh, insects. And what is so good about controlling rodents. Are rodents bad? You wouldn't want them in there out in your house, but are they good or bad for the ecosystem? No, they're good. They're good. But the problem is if there are too many of them, then they're a problem because they will eat our crops, spread disease, and disrupt the natural ecosystem. So it's the amount of rodents that snakes are healthy. And how else are snakes good? They provide from their venom. It's a source of medicine. Now sometimes it's a wash because often it's used, their venom is used as anti-venom to protect from that snake. But sometimes it's not a wash, the venom is used as other medicine. And why else are snakes good? Spody control. We said that, road control. The area of the soil in some country? Well, not, not so much because they mainly, they, they do it some, some. They feed off. But, uh, but they um, are eaten by who? Eagles. So they support birds, foxes, coyotes. Skunks, etc. Other snakes. Oh. Right, I'm sorry. Before the poetry, I forgot. Oh. This is Pedro. <laughs> he is a desert tortoise. He is a vegetarian. He normally Camera. eats um, cactus, cactus flowers, desert plants. The plant, the flowers of desert plants in the desert, lives in the deserts of California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona. And this one is a male. This is, uh, are there children in the room now? There are not. So this is the bit that he uses to get on the back of the female for sex. This is not a headrest. This is to push other males, fighting with other males for territory and females. And the one that gets pushed more gives up and leaves. They don't usually hurt each other. Once in a while, the loser gets thrown on the back, 
Usually the front legs are sufficient to get them up over upright and okay. Sometimes they are in such a position they can't get back and they die from the heat of the sun. Living in the desert, it gets very cold at night, especially in the winter, very hot in the day. Great temperature range. They dig burrows up to 30 feet and live in them. And in the burrows, they can keep warm and they hibernate in the winter. He lives in my backyard and has plenty of space and a good life, but I don't want him burrowing. So I artificially hibernate him in a box with rags. So he's plenty insulated and dark and yet cold enough. If too warm, when he's hibernating, his metabolism will go too much and he will starve. But he, unlike snakes, eats a little bit every day. I don't feed him the desert plants. They're not so easy to get. I feed him fruits like <coughs> oranges, apples, peaches, and vegetables like carrots, spinach, broccoli. And I uh, don't pay anything for them. I get them free from Safeway. And I sprinkle on calcium and vitamins on there to make sure he gets his nutrients. And he's in danger. Now, his burrow is used by many organisms, rats, kangaroo rats, mice, snakes, lizards, to regulate their temperature using this burrow. And that is the type of symbiosis, which is? He doesn't get anything in return, so it's come. Um, commensalism. Commensalism. And um, uh, he's endangered because the desert has been developed with shopping centers and housing developments. His habitat is being destroyed. He is protected, so there is a desert preserve in the desert, Mojave Desert, which I've been to. And it is illegal to take them out of the wild. And uh, this was removed by a woman, an old woman near Las Vegas. And uh, the thing is, it's also illegal to return them once you take them out of the wild because they home straight back to their place they were born. They know how to do this. With all the freeways in California, this would be very bad. Now, the box turtle from the east was introduced with its own little commensal parasite, little mycoplasm, not quite a bacteria because there's no cell wall, that never hurts it, just lives in the box turtle, but jumped to this, caused a disease and killed a lot, then adapted to it and doesn't hurt it anymore. It's now commensal instead of a parasite. However, if I stress this guy, he gets too cold all of a sudden, that will jump from his gut to his respiratory system, and he will get nose discharge like a cold. He bumps his food before he eats. He cannot, uh, he won't eat if he can't smell the food. He bumps it with his nose to smell it. He will starve. So uh, I have to treat him with antibiotics to cure it if he gets it, which he did twice. So I have to be very careful. Now, if you return them to the wild after they've been several months in uh, captive, that mycoplasm adapts and becomes different. You let it out, and uh, this into the wild, it will, with a different evolved domestic mycoplasm, make other tortoises sick. <laughs> the other reason they are endangered is people collecting them people um, as pets, people uh, going in off-road vehicles which come past the desert so their desert plants can't grow, thus killing lots of wildlife, not just them, and causing their burrows to collapse, and sometimes the macho riders of these off-road vehicles like to shoot them. Oh, what's the sport It's ridiculous. Uh, no sport at all. And finally, because there's more human trash refuse, there are more ravens, the wolf friend, the ravens, which 
eat the eggs and young of these. So overpopulation of ravens due to humans is uh, endangering these guys. So that's why they're endangered, that's what they eat, and that is Pedro. I wanted to kind of move things along. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I want to get to the poetry now. I'm going to let you hold him and touch him later. Okay? How old is he? Uh, he's probably, he looks like he's, did you say how old or how long? Oh, how old. He, he's about, I would say, almost a foot and a half, a little less. His age, they live to be about 80 to 100. He's probably mm. about 65. Huh. I can't be sure. Um, but they store water in their bladder very well. They're very adapted to storing water. People picking them up in the wild, they get scared and eject the water. So this is very bad for them. Uh, OK, uh, any questions on the animal? Why do you say the population of ravens is increasing? Uh, because humans have so much refuse, so many landfills with trash that the ravens are able to eat. So we are supplying them with more access to food in desert areas. Crows, by the way, their relatives are, have gone way, way up to the Bay area because of modified habitats that they, being very, very smart birds, have adapted to. Other questions on the animals? All right, I promise you later you get to hold Pedro, you get to touch him. Now, this book, after all those introductions, by the way, in the back of the book there's a publisher's blurb with me and a picture of Pedro and me in my backyard in my uh, bee-friendly yard I planted, and my Dalina horse, which is the Swedish traditional horse from my fam father's side of the family. And also at the beginning, there's a blurb about me at the beginning of the book, and some things about where I was inspired to influence my thoughts. All right, are we all ready at midnight? OK, midnight. Let's meet in the magnet of midnight, where the sea's fingers fondle the shore. We'll be white in the candle of moonlight. We'll be black in the ocean's red roar. If you fear the maelstrom of midnight, as the waves wash my sea dreams of you, should too slight be a cloak made of moonlight, let's merge in the dawn's silver deep. Page 30, please. We're going to have an environmental piece. Remember, my Pachamama theory is largely based on James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis. Gaia is the Greek goddess of the Earth. So therefore, we have the Greek goddess in deep sleep as things go around her. Gaian slumber. <coughs> Queen. Your ocean dreams are green. Cheeks of cockled whelk, hair of tawny kelp, eyes of molten emerald quiver, hands of abalone silver, suspended by an icicle above the bitter sea. You dream of calico crabs in mouths of singing sharks, parrotfish that swim in parabolic arcs. Purple frosted stars and humming nights, terse virgin indigo and virgin white. Queen, your lost in forest dreams, waste of woven winnowed laurel, limber legs of shaded sorrel, your mind seduced by crystal mandolins, songs of blue tongued saffron dragons, <laughs> moths and sloth for fluorescent ocelot. Poison arrow frogs with purple spots. You sleep and dream in seething them. Awake, your children are destroying the earth. Now let's look at a poem called This Water. And it is on page 121. <coughs> No? It's 
not on page 1, excuse me. This water is on page, hmm, is that 53? I misread the line in the index there. 53. 53. This is a poem about the great interrelatedness of all things, so it's relevant to today's talk that you heard earlier. This water, this drop of water was in the throat of a thirsty Tyrannosaurus after it dined on a Triceratops. Babylon's gardens hanging and dripping. The Pacific Ocean carving a rock sculpture at Big Sur. The red rain that washed over aboriginal rock carvings on Ayers Rock. Bacteria frozen in Antarctic ice for 2,000 years before reviving. The breath of a Tibetan Lama, the piss of an Andean Yama, a pool in a Vermilion in a Costa Rican rainforest canopy where a poison arrow frog tadpole swing. The lichen on a rock cannot make it without the help of their women and the men get all the credit. And I have a little story for you. Uh, my dad took me to do two Nobel Prize ceremonies, and in one of them, uh, one of the winners in medicine, he shared it, was from the University of Texas, I believe, Dr. Brown, did research in uh, his uh, discoveries on cholesterol. And at the Nobel Prize dinner, he gave a little story. And the story goes like this. A Nobel Prize winner pulled up with his wife to a gas station. And at the gas station, the, uh, his wife got out and started talking to a gas station attendant who back in those days pumped gas. It's not all self-serve back in those days. And they went on for 20 minutes talking happily. And he's waiting, twiddling his thumbs, the Nobel Prize winner is. So she finally gets in the car. And they drive off. And he says, well, that was quite an intimate talk you had with that gas station attendant going on 20, 25 minutes. What, what's that about? Oh, that was an old boyfriend of mine. In fact, uh, I almost married him instead of you. <laughs> the Nobel Prize winner beat his chest so proud, said, oh, boy, are you smart. <laughs> you just about married him, and he pumps gas, and you married me. I won a Nobel Prize. She said, no, you have it wrong. You see, if I married him, he would have won the Nobel <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted to say that <laughs> by way of acknowledging Sharon Murder, the wife of W. Murder, for coming here. Thank you, Sharon. My pleasure. <laughs> and now, my business for the day is done. Because, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> so uh, we are going to have our moderator introduce our speaker. Thank you for your attention. Of my
They are the first people who both saw and photographed a single molecule. One single molecule. As a result of this work, optical study of single molecules have subsequently been widely used in chemistry, in physics, biology. It's a good thing. And um, he's with us here today. Interestingly, he was born locally. Wasn't it? Over the hill. Um, I have a little data on him for his high school activities. Uh, he was busy. He participated in many activities. And among them, or perhaps the entire list, but um, he was in the band, speech and debate, math and science contest team. That sounds great. Bi Phi Kim, that's physics chem apparently. Bio. Biophysics chem. Yeah. Mask and Gavel, the National Honor Society, the Boy Scouts. All right. He was involved as a amateur ham radio club member. Russian club. He was in the form, the uh, forum social club. A couple more things. You were a Toastmaster, huh? <laughs> and uh, this is a room for Toastmasters. Isn't it? He was uh, on the. It's an on-the-spot team. I'm not quite sure what that is, but it's on the spot. And as an editor. He was editing a piece called the um, Each Has Spoken. Each Has Spoken. So, um, what a wonderful set of preparation. Dr. Mira and his wife, Sharon. We want to, want to separate them apart. That's what resolution means. Well, uh, there are some fancy methods like uh, x ray and, and uh, magnetic resonance. Maybe I won't use it. Uh, sorry to be blocking some of these people. I'm not really going to try. I mean, really block you if I stood there. Uh, these these things like X-rays and NMR, uh, like your MRI, if you've heard about electron microscopy, those are uh, very good for looking at things very tiny like this. But you have to freeze it, or you have to, in, in fact, destroy the sample when you make the measurements on some of those some of those cases. Like uh, if you're going to use very high power X-rays, you'll you'll eventually burn up the sample, potentially, in order to get the image. The uh, point is, they're, they're not easy to use for live cells. And we're interested in looking in live cells. We're interested in seeing how things really work. Um, on the other hand, there's light. There's uh, optics. Optics uh, is very powerful. You, you've seen microscopes that uh, are, are sometimes in, in high school labs and, and that sort of thing that can be able to look at, at tiny objects. Uh, they work on light. They don't work on x-rays or electrons using a uh, light. And this is, of course, the International Year of Light from 2015. I have a little uh, pen here for International Year of Light. Uh, and there's a celebration going on all around the world about the things you can do with light. This is all done with light. And I'll explain these sort of images in a moment, although they're, they're fancy and they're colored and they look 3D and all of that sort of thing. But each one of these little mountains is uh, basically the light coming from one molecule. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> all right, so one molecule. Let's, let's talk about this, the scale in a different way, okay? uh, the scale of all this. Um, you, um, how many here have, have heard of, of, of uh, what a mole is? Anybody heard of what a mole is? OK, excellent. You, this is fantastic. I'm so, I'm so pleased about that. So in, 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 uh, you've heard a little bit about number here, science class. So an ounce of water is about a mole of water, OK? Um, and uh, so that, you know, imagine that, that, that ounce of water. It has uh, a huge number of water molecules in it, right? Uh, here's Avogadro's number, 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd water molecules. All right? <clears throat> Snowflake, uh, a lot smaller, uh, 10 to the 15th to 10 to the 17th water molecules. So uh, we probe one molecule at a time, one. So you know that that must mean that the amount of moles is 1 over uh, Avogadro's number of moles, right? It's 1 over Na moles. Now, if, remember that's uh, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, right? So 1 over that is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24. One molecule is this many moles, right? Not very many moles, right? 
mm -hmm. an incredibly big negative exponent. Mm -hmm. it makes an unbelievably small amount of moles. Um, well, the, the, the chemists and, and other scientists have decided we want to make names for these, these negative exponents. We've already talked about a few. Micro, 10 to the minus 6. Nano, 10 to the minus 9. And then there's one for 10 to the minus 12, and 10 to the minus 15, Pinto, you know, 10 to the minus 18, Addo, 10 to the minus 21. Anybody know? Zeto. Yes. Zeto. Very good, very good. And, and uh, 10 to the minus 24 is a Yakto. Yakto. So, <laughs> really, I have no idea where that came from. It's interesting to figure out where that crazy thing came from. But we believe that it's much better to call one molecule one guacamole. <laughs> one over avocado's number of moles. <laughs> All right, so in my lab, you see, we have not only a mole, but we have a guacamole. <laughs> I mean, if you go to the American Chemical Society, you can buy this guy here. He's got an American Chemical Society logo. Oh. <laughs> but the students are so clever, right, that they uh, give him some, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, the next question. Why do you want to see a single molecule? I mean, who cares, right? <laughs> that is an unbelievably small number of moles, right? So <clears throat> why do we want to do that? You want to think about it this way, and I'll, I'll give you some reasons for it. But uh, if, if you, uh, if I try to measure, let's say, uh, the weight or some other property of, of some of this water in this in this uh, uh, in this container, you know, by conventional chemical methods, I might be averaging over many many molecules. If I'm going to measure a huge number of molecules, I'm going to have to average uh, over the property for all of those molecules. Um, so think of it about like this. Here's, here's an analogy. I'm going to show you a couple of analogies so you can see the general idea. This is Mile High Stadium. Now, where, now, where's that? Oh, Denver, Denver, right? Denver. Denver Broncos. So here's a game, and you see it's most, you, you see sort of uh, something like orange and blue if you, if you look at the stadium, right? Because obviously there's a lot of Broncos fans there, right? That's sort of an average picture. But if we can look closely at the individuals, do we see just blue and orange? No, they're playing Green Bay. See, so look, here's, here's some of those individuals, yellow and green, that uh, you might find if you look very, very closely. Now, it's, it's not just saying, oh, we're only going to look at the rare things, but the, the point is there might be some things here that you can't see just because you averaged overall. Mm -hmm. so, so that's one reason we want to be able to look at individuals. Here's another, another analogy, analogy, different analogy, baseball analogy, all right? So, hey, right? So, uh, you may remember that back in 2004, the Boston Red Sox were the series champs, okay? And, and of course, this was done by my student who loved the Red, uh, you know, loved the Red Sox, okay? So that's why it's a Red Sox story, rather than you know. But these easily could be, you know, uh, for anything else here, right? So here's some here's some data. Here's some team data. Sorry, this is not gonna work. Team data. Um, let's see. Uh, and what's being shown here is the team batting average, all right? So here's Ranheim, their batting average, Boston's batting average, Baltimore's batting average, St. Louis, and so forth, right? <coughs> so, but what is the batting average for the team? Well, it's the average of all the batting averages of the individual, you know, team members, right? And we call that an ensemble measure because it's, that means it's the whole, whole uh, uh, group being averaged over, right, the whole team. Well, what's more interesting for us as scientists is to not just have the average, but to have what we call a distribution. A distribution where we plot here the, the batting average of the individuals on the team, and here we plot the number of players that have that batting average. This is what we call a distribution. That's the term for this kind of a plot. How many people have what values of this, okay? And, and you see, okay, well, this is kind of interesting. Here's a bunch of uh, people that have, you know, batting averages kind of near 2.8, uh, 0.28, okay, the, the average for the team. What's this over here? Pitchers. Pitchers, <laughs> exactly. There's your pitchers, right? <laughs> oh, <I'm not. laughs> so the, the point here, if, if you don't have anything but the average over all this, you wouldn't have seen this special population that has some interesting behavior. So it's, it's sort of asking the, that kind of a question. Now, uh, um, let me just go one step. Uh, let me just say that what we're doing by looking for single molecules is to translate this idea from baseball to the nanoscale, really. 
We, we want to measure properties molecule by molecule so we can make that kind of a distribution. Um, <clears throat> so we're really uh, asking ourselves, uh, are the individual copies the same? Are they all the same, like the average number? Or are they marching to different drummers in some way or another? Because they might have different uh, local environments or other perturbations that make them be a little different from one another. Um, and I, I'm not going to, I, I don't want to go into, I don't want to sort of confuse you, but just to show you that in our kinds of data these days on single molecules, we make that same kind of plot. It, here's a, a number, and here's a, some thing that we measure molecule by molecule. And we can ask whether the molecules are, it's called the energy transfer efficiency. Don't worry about that. The point is we're making this kind of distribution measurement now. And uh, we can ask, is there heterogeneity? That's another way to say this. Is there heterogeneity that we didn't know about? Hidden heterogeneity. Uh, we can also watch molecules as a function of time. Well, this is another way of thinking about all this. Here's a molecule that turned on and started giving us some signal, and then goes off, on, off, on, off, on, and then goes off again. All of that behavior is really fascinating to be able to see, because at the single molecule level, you can see this happening. Imagine if you had a million and they're all doing this randomly, you just see a smear. You can't see all of this uh, interesting structure that tells you it's doing something that we didn't expect. So that's, um, this whole idea, of course, has, has great potential when we have a complex system like a cell, where there are different local environments or enzymes in different states. So, you know, it's really exciting to be able to, uh, you know, talk a little bit about this here in the Darwin Day celebration, because what I'm, what I'm doing, of course, is telling you that what I'm, all of our research is related to some problems in biology right now, even though we're using ideas from Einstein and Newton. So we're, we're using, and I'll tell, you'll see that in a few seconds, that we're, we're connecting some of these uh, the great scientists of the 20th century and the 19th century and, and putting them all together. That's the beauty of sort of the things that are going on today. Uh, and in particular, in, uh, in cells, many processes occur at the single copy level. There are these little machines, little enzymes that move around, motors that walk along, cracks <laughs> inside the cell. And, uh. and they are working pretty much on their own in a way. They use ATP, they use various energy sources and that kind of thing and some other signals. But uh, if you just average over all of them, you can't see those individuals walking. So uh, that's why uh, there's just so many interesting applications in biology. All right, so now uh, I wanted to start talking about uh, one of the key kinds of molecules that we study, fluorescent molecules, okay? Fluorescent molecules. So who, who's, who know, who's heard of a fluorescent molecule? About half, okay? So this is great. Uh, let's, can we can turn the lights down, then I will show you and demonstrate for you some uh, fluorescent molecules um, and, and to show you the general idea, and then we'll analyze it from the point of view of Einstein. Uh, so here's, here's a, a vial, okay, it's got some liquid in it, as you can see, and uh, there is, of course, the solvent, which is transparent, and then uh, in that solvent, or the liquid, I've, I've uh, put a very small concentration of fluorescent molecules. Now, fluorescent molecules are ones that, when you pump them with one color of light, they'll give you another color of light, at longer wavelength. That's one way to think about it. And it's very much like uh, day glow socks. You know, if you've got, if, if you've uh, seen these days, you have there have been day glow T-shirts in our age, and there the, the kids wear a sort of you know uh, socks or uh, or tie their shoelaces. The shoelaces are fluorescent; they, they give off light. Uh, and, and so that's what this molecule is like. It's very much like those kind of molecules. And uh, what I want you to see is that I'm going to take this green laser. So it's a, it's clearly a green laser beam, right? And I'm going to shoot it through the liquid. And it's going to pump those molecules inside, and you'll see what we call the fluorescence from the molecule. All right? So you ready? No. So it's uh, this is a really interesting effect. You see, I'm sending in green light, and what color am I getting, am I getting out? Yellow. 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 Or yellow green, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you, if you might notice, you see you see it going through. You can see that the, the light that after it passes through it. Let me show you. After it passes through it, what color is it? Green. The same green. green is before. Yeah, it's the same green. Okay, so mm -hmm. the, the laser beam is always green. This yellow that you're seeing is, is coming from the molecules mm -hmm. that are getting pumped by the green light and giving you yellow light back. Yeah. So I have a little <laughs> lightsaber here, you know, inside the liquid, right? All right, so that's, that's fluorescence. This is the phenomenon of fluorescence. 
uh, and uh, it, it occurs because as the, as the beam goes through, it pumps the molecules that, that hit it, or that are hit by the, the beam, and they shoot out the yellow light in all directions. That's why it seems to sort of glow uh, and, and, and send light toward you, okay? Even though the laser beam does not change color. Mm -hmm. So now let's do that from the point of view of Einstein. All right. And the way we think about that is to recognize that uh, a molecule uh, can, has states. Uh, that is, uh, and, and also this comes from concepts called quantum mechanics, in which I'm not going to go into great detail, but it, the basic idea of quantum mechanics is that molecules have states. That is, they have energy levels. And when you make a drawing like this, this line means the ground state, and it has a particular energy, the energy of the ground state. So the molecule starts here, unexcited, and that green light uh, comes in, and I'm calling it a photon because that's the way we think about the light from these uh, lasers. For example, the individual photons, the green photon uh, is absorbed by the molecule and pumps it to an excited state. So we have a ground state and an excited state. Uh, and uh, the act of absorbing puts energy into the molecule, right, as it goes from one state to another. Now, what happens after that is that the molecule relaxes a little bit, and then if it's a fluorescent molecule like these that I showed you, that, that excited molecule emits a photon. It, it sends out light, spits back a, uh, a piece of light, now at a longer wavelength, all right? So the absorbing at a, higher, a shorter wavelength or higher energy, after relaxation, you get a longer wavelength, lower energy, all right? So um, that's, uh, that's this phenomenon of fluorescence. Uh, and that's going to be really critical because what we are doing essentially is we figured out ways to detect just one of the molecules, just one of these emitting molecules at a time, instead of uh, billions and trillions. I mean, you're, you're, right here you're seeing the light from, from billions and trillions. Mm -hmm. But it, using the, the methods that have been perfected by uh, my group and other groups, you can, you can actually look inside a microscope now and with your eyes see the light coming from a single molecule. Because of this process, because it is continues to absorb and spit out, absorb and spit out, and so forth, these photons, and there are enough of them for you to see them with your own. Okay, so here's kind of how that works. Uh, uh, here's a picture of, of those little uh, energy levels again with some more details, but don't worry about the details. You can see I'm pumping up and I'm coming down and emitting photons. And if I take a, a microscope like this one I'm going to show you here, you can, you can see dots that are coming from the individual molecules. You can see little spots of light, all right? Mm -hmm. Like looking up in the star, at the, seeing stars in the sky at night. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty simple microscope. We shine a laser in, we focus it down with a special lens, and then you can see there's the emitted light that comes back in the same direction. Uh, and uh, there's some filters, and then finally there's a camera, or your eyeball. You can see with your eye as well. And, uh, so essentially, uh, all of the experiments now that, that look at single molecules use this kind of a simple apparatus. We're, we're, and, and, uh, and of course, there's challenges. You have to uh, meet some requirements and do it carefully, but, but it's being used all over the world now. Uh, uh, just to give you a little history, this happened originally the first time the detection of a single molecule was done in my lab at, at IBM Research Labs in, in South San Jose in 1989. Um, and that was more than 25 years ago. Uh, and uh, soon after that, people uh, moved to room temperature. Uh, the whole, all of us moved to room temperature away from low temperatures because the first experiment was a, a very fundamental low temperature experiment, uh, simply pushing back the frontiers, trying to explore regimes that hadn't been explored before. And now after moving to room temperature and explosion of, of its use in biology, you know, we, we're doing what we're doing today. Okay, so some examples. Let me show you some, some examples. If you use that simple apparatus and look at single molecules, uh, here's a, a, a molecule that's fluorescent. Okay, that, that is a, just a symbol for a, a whole bunch of benzene rings that are all sort of fused together. That's basically what that means. Uh, and here's benzene rings that are connected by a single bond. So this is something that only absorbs in the ultraviolet. So it's basically transparent, it's a host. And if I look at the light coming from a sample, 
uh, I, I see this. Uh, here's the X, here's X and Y, and then that's uh, a color scale of how much light is coming out of that piece of the sample, which if I now turn this and tilt it, then I have a 3D rendering. That's the light coming from that molecule. Hmm. Okay? <clears throat> so it's just different ways of displaying the same kind of picture. Hmm. All right, great. So you can look at it in some kind of a solid or a crystal, and those are important sort of fundamental starting steps. But let me show you in, in some cells. Let's see some single molecules in cells now. Um, and and, and in this case, what I want to explain is which molecule are we looking at and how are we making it fluorescent? Because not every molecule is fluorescent in a cell. In fact, the cell is mostly transparent, except at short wavelengths. So uh, the, the, the molecule of interest, the biological molecule of interest here, is this one, uh, which is called the major histocompatibility <coughs> complex of type 2. <laughs> a ridiculously long name, MHC2. It's one of our immune system proteins. These, this structure sits on the surface of the cell, sits in the cell membrane, and it has to do with antigens, okay? Uh, recognizing when there's an antigen present or not present. Part of, as I say, part of the immune system. Uh, and what, what, so it's the, in, in a protein structure, it's the blue and white here. It's been labeled by taking the antigen and sticking a fluorescent label on the antigen. In other words, this thing binds an antigen and sort of holds it and sticks it to the outside so it can be t detected by T cell. It's basically how it works. It's the, the idea is that the, the, the um, protein of interest has been labeled with a fluorescent dye. And so this is an image from the microscope now uh, of, of looking down at the top of the cell. And here's the outline of the cell. I'm looking right here at the upper surface of the cell because we're just we're doing this experiment right through the cell. The rest of it's all transparent, the, uh, so we don't have a problem with that. That whole microscope that I showed you would be down here below, sending light up through and, and collecting it back. And we're now looking at that result, okay, on a camera, camera device. You see these single molecules; they're scattered all over the surface. But of course, the the cool thing is that it's not just a static story now; it's at room temperature and Here's what you see as you watch it as a function of time. You see a fantastic dance of the molecules on the surface of the cell. They're being driven all around by, by thermal excitation. I mean, we're working, at the, at this, in this case, at 22 degrees centigrade. In your body, 37 degrees centigrade, the, the molecules in your cell membranes are moving even faster. And uh, this is thermal excitation, essentially. It's just the fact that uh, collisions with other, other molecules uh, cause these surface proteins to move around. And, and we call it diffusion. It's a process that, that, that can be studied to try to understand the behavior of the membrane. But uh, you also see a few more things in this picture, by the way. Not only do you see the motion, but you also see them disappearing, right? Mm -hmm. They're turning off. Um, you see some of the some of these little balls <coughs> become a buzz, bigger fuzzy balls. That's that's when they move down off the surface. When they move out of focus, they, they become a bigger fuzzy ball. Uh, <coughs> and maybe you see some even kind of sticking together. Another sort of interesting mm -hmm. fact. So there's there's so much to be learned by looking at these individual molecules because they're telling you what they're doing about, by their motion, if you like. The turning off is coming from the fluorescent molecule, which eventually dies. It eventually photo bleaches. Okay, just like just like your your uh, bleached blue jeans. It was not, it had a color, but it later uh, became white. That's because the molecules are bleached. And of course, you pay all kind of money, right, to get the you know bleached bleached jeans, right? But <laughs> here we're asking the molecule to give us a bunch of light back, photons back, and after about a million photons, molecules often give up. So you have a million photons to live with to extract information, okay? All right, so uh, that's, a, that's a, one of the examples of, you know, looking at single molecules, but let's start, let's move a little bit more close, uh, closer to the, uh, the Nobel Prize and the, and the topics that, of course, the prize were, uh, was all about. And uh, th this prize was given for the development of super-resolved fluorescence microscopy. So it's not just fluorescence microscopy, but this special thing called super resolve. So, so what does that mean? That, that's what, of course, I want to explain now. And here's my other two colleagues, uh, Eric Betzig and Stefan Hell, 
uh, we, we, we didn't work directly together, but because of the community of scientists and, and publishing of each other's work and so forth, <coughs> we of course knew about each other's work and, and uh, were inspired by it in different ways at different times. My work was very early, uh, before these two guys got involved in this area, and, and they made really critical contributions later on. So it's been uh, it's a, a great honor to be, uh, to be recognized with them. Uh, <clears throat> so now, uh, let me try to explain what this business is of super resolution. Uh, <clears throat> so here's a bacterial cell. Remember, the bacteria are smaller than the cells in our body. And it's only a couple of microns, one or two microns long, and about 500 nanometers across. And what we have done now is to, is to label specific proteins inside the cell with a, a, a yellow fluorescent protein. One of these fluorescent proteins, like green fluorescent protein, it makes them light up, all right? So think of, the, think of it as if uh, we, we, we want to see protein X. And so every one of protein X's it has a little fluorescent dye hanging off of it. Okay, that's basically what's going on here. So you want to see the structure, right? So what do you do? How do you see it? Well, <clears throat> well, you buy the most expensive microscope you can, huh? <laughs> Here's that really expensive microscope. Unfortunately, you don't see any de detail. It looks fuzzy, right? Well, that's because of this thing called the diffraction limit. Um, even though the labels, here's one of the labels. Remember I said uh, you fuse the protein of interest to this fluorescent protein, and so it's the, it's the fluorescent object, it's the little dye, basically. It's only about three nanometers in size, but if I look at it on a microscope, it appears to be a couple hundred nanometers in size. The spot appears much bigger than the actual size of the molecule because of the diffraction limit. Uh, Ernst Abbe, uh, in Germany in the 1800s, uh, realized this and wrote down this equation. It basically says lambda, the wavelength of light, divided by two times something called the numerical aperture. This is about one. It's, it's basically lambda over two. For, for 500 nanometer light, like this laser is about 500 nanometers, what this law says is that you cannot, uh, the molecule will appear to be that big. It'll appear to be much larger than its actual size. Roughly half the wavelength of light. It's because we're using light to see it. It's because light has a wavelength, and you're not going to see detail much smaller than the wavelength. That's basically it, basically the reason for all this. So that's called the diffraction limit, and that's why that image is fuzzy. Super resolution means, sorry, here. So the reason for the diffraction uh, limit is the wavelength of the light. Right, right. And so this is why if you switch to x-rays or if you switch to electrons, which have much, much shorter wavelengths, you can see much finer detail. But the price you pay is that you destroy the sample and can't look at live cells and look at motions uh, when things may be changing. Okay? So the whole point here is to do something about this problem, but still staying with visible light um, and keeping its advantage. Right. So um, <coughs> super resolution means bypassing this limit, and what we get is something like that. Yeah. So the, uh, the excitement of this whole area is to be able to go from this situation where you see nothing, really, uh, except just the blur, but to be able to see something much, much finer. And uh, to be able to do this, to be able to, to break this fundamental physical law, requires a couple of key, key ingredients. So I'm gonna I'm gonna explain the ingredients here step by step. We'll work through it. It's a it's a there's a, a couple of extra things uh, that you know you, we have to all sort of uh, you know follow along, right? The first point is you want to be able to see single molecules. We're basically gonna do this with these single molecules. This is how we're gonna make this work. We're gonna use the fact that they are really tiny little beacons of light, okay? And and but use it in a clever way. So the first point is. <coughs> Some, we want to do something called super localizing the molecule. Super localized. Well, what do I mean by that? Uh, here's a picture of, of a beautiful cinder cone uh, that uh, you can see in, in Crater Lake, or that I urge you to visit if you possibly can. It's just spectacularly beautiful. Uh, of course, since, since I'm a scientist, I have to have a scale bar. <laughs> so this is 120 times 10 to the 9th nanometers. Okay, 10 to the 9th nanometers? Yeah. That's one meter, right? 120. <laughs> I put it in nanometer units, just to remind us we're doing nanometers today, right? 
So uh, you know that if you just take your cell phone and just walk up to the top of this mountain, you can read out the coordinates of the position of the mountain, right? So that's the idea. We're applying that to molecules. We're applying that to these single molecules. Here's an image of a single molecule in a bacteria. Just like the pictures I showed you earlier. We just turned it into a little mountain by, by making it 3D and turning it and stuff. It's width. It has the diffraction limit. Of course, it's, it's not going to look narrower than the diffraction limit. But if I, if I use a, a, a function and fit the shape of it, because I know the shape, I've measured the shape. Since I have the shape of information, I can find the position of the peak where that little pur that purple uh, magenta arrow is. So that's the thing we're going to extract, the position of the single molecule, even though the spot is really big due to diffraction. So here's uh, a, another way of showing it. Here's an image of a single molecule. It's, it's spread across several pixels of the detector, right? And so I can use those different pixel numbers to, to fit and find the position, to find very precisely where the center is. So that's idea number one. Well, this works fine if your molecules are separated, if they're all far apart, but it doesn't let you distinguish two that are really close together, okay? So the second idea is something called active control of emitting concentrations, which I'm going to explain now. Uh, <clears throat> we as experimentalists uh, want to control how many molecules are emitting at a given time, and we do that because we're, we select molecules and situations where we can turn the molecules on and off. So this is a really key part of the whole idea. We want to have molecules that sometimes are dark, but other times are bright and give fluorescence. And uh, if we can have that and, and, and actively control it when they're on and off, then we can solve the problem. So here's how it works. We want to see this structure, okay? And so first we, uh, uh, and it's, uh, it's got, a, you know, it looks like a spiral or whatever. We decorate the structure with labels, with these little fluorescent molecules, right? We can, we can try to attach them at many positions along the structure of interest. Uh, if we let them all emit at the same time, then we get this blurry image, because all of those little uh, fraction limited spots like that all just overlap, right? So you can see the solution now. You just, don't, you just make sure they don't emit all at the same time. You use some trick to turn part of them off, most of them off, a huge number of them off. Uh, or, or for example, take molecules that are um, not fluorescent until you turn them on, okay, by some method. So uh, if you turn them on very weakly, then you'll have only a few of them on. And if you have only a few, there's no problem with fitting and finding their positions like we did here, all right? Yeah. Then, you, then you photo bleach and turn on some more, and of course, we're and polymerizes to make microtubules, to make very long structures that are involved with uh, cell division and other parts of this, the skeletal machinery of the cell. Uh, and uh, so here's one frame from the camera. The camera has taken one picture, and you see all the single molecules here. It's operating in this regime that I'm talking about, where you have a low concentration uh, of, of molecules that are allowed to emit at this moment. Um, <clears throat> that's a diffraction-limited image. Uh, and over here are the positions uh, of all of those single molecules that we found by, by fitting those little mountains. And uh, then the next frame of the camera is this, the next frame of the camera is this, next frame, and so on. And as you let this roll for a while, you see this incredible structure up here. And that's the diffraction limited <laughs> structure, and here's the super resolution structure. So yeah, it's wow, exactly right. It's cool to be able to see that much more uh, detail that could not be seen uh, before by, by optical methods. Um, <clears throat> I want to also show you in bacteria how this works, because we've been talking a little bit about bacteria. Here on the left, there's some bacteria. And this is a white light image. If you sort of just look through the microscope, you see a bunch of bacteria there. Here's the fluorescence image from that same cell, that same set of cells. and uh, Enhanced yellow fluorescent protein, one of these uh, labels has been bound to a particular protein X of interest, protein, you know, that you want to see. Uh, and again, the movie tells you, you know, the beautiful, beautiful uh, raw data that we use to detect and, and produce the final image. All of these blinks are coming from that yellow fluorescent protein, which is, in this case, it's blinking on and off. That's the on-off mechanism, the on-off control mechanism. They turn on and off. 
and, and we work under these conditions where most of them are off and only a few are on, and, and record movies like that. So let me show you the results. So here's three different cases. This is, these are bacterial cells, and this one, something called MREB has been labeled, and this one, PARA has been labeled, and this one, HU has been labeled. So those are just an al alphabet soup. It's just the biologist's uh, way of naming different proteins that are inside the cell. The fraction limited images don't show you much, right? Because of uh, the problem. This is super resolution. It's really amazing. It's, it's just like a veil. A veil has been lifted. And uh, that is, uh, it, it lets us see that that particular protein has a structure, uh, looks a little bit helical. Mm -hmm. This one is running sort of down the center of the cell. Uh, this protein is involved with uh, cell division. Uh, when, when the DNA is duplicated, then a new copy, the second copy of the DNA has to be moved from one end to the other. And this is involved with moving the DNA. This one is a DNA binding protein. It's a, it's a small protein that just sticks to the DNA at many locations. And so this is a sample of where the DNA is inside mm -hmm. the cell. So um, this is why uh, all people, you know, everyone is excited. Because it's not just a, uh, a small improvement in resolution. If, if we were at 200 and 250 nanometers before, and now at 40, it's a factor of five or more. That's a huge improvement. And, and you can see for yourself that there's so much more information in these kind of images. So it's, it's, it can, can tell us more about cell biology, how things work inside these cells. The two on, on the left are, are both live, are living. This is a, a, a fixed cell. And we can do it in 3D as well. So we, we use optical tricks in my lab to uh, mm. not just do 2D images, two-dimensional images, but 3D, because of course the, the world was three-dimensional. And uh, this is, of course, this is a crazy acronym that the students have come up with called spray paint. But you know, it's <laughs> it's just a, them having fun. But let me just say that here's in, in this 3D image, there's a whole bunch of bacteria, and uh, the surface of the bacteria has been labeled with one kind of molecule that that blinks on and off to tell us where the surface is. So that's the the white and gray is is the surface mm -hmm. of the bacteria, and uh, in in yellow and orange inside the the cell. Uh, a particular protein has been labeled, CRES has been labeled, it's a so-called crescentin protein, and you can see uh, uh, that there are, is a structure inside. There's, there's a helix, there's a, something that these, these proteins are doing inside the bacteria. All right, <clears throat> so um, uh, the, the 3D aspect is very uh, important, and a lot of our sort of work is, is related to the optics of making 3D work properly. There, there's some uh, tricks that, that are used for that. I won't describe in detail right now. I want to tell you about a completely different way of lighting up uh, interesting structures, uh, a, a way of controlling whether molecules are visible or not, or whether the fluorescence is on or off. And the example I want to give here uh, is, is a, has a name uh, called PAINT, Points Accumulation for Imaging and Nanoscale Topography. That's an acronym that these people came up with in, in 2006 when they proposed this particular scheme. <coughs> and we've been uh, applying this to uh, cells that have channels on them, ion channels. Uh, and it turns out that ion channels are very important for nerves and nerve transmission, nerve signal transmission. Okay? Channels are required. Uh, and uh, we're, we're using this wild looking molecule here, this one that has this crazy structure, uh, with lots of asymmetry in it. That's a molecule called saxitoxin. Uh, it's a neurotoxin uh, that, that binds to voltage-gated sodium channels, a particular kind of channel, voltage-gated sodium channels. So uh, in, there's, there's some organisms that, that produce this toxin, and that's how they sort of deaden okay, their prey, right? <laughs> but we can use it for science. We can, uh, since my friend here, Justin Dubois at Stanford, can synthesize this, then he synthesizes it and attaches a fluorescent dye. That psi five is a fluorescent dye. So now we have a toxin with a fluorescent label on it. Remember these fluorescent molecules? They're going to show us where this is, and it binds to voltage-gated sodium channels. So the experiment goes like this: We've got a cell growing in solution, right? So it's growing, and we just add this to the solution outside. Mm -hmm. So what happens? Well, the molecules when they're when they're free in solution, they're zooming around pretty fast, so they don't. You don't see them very well. They look dark. But when they bind to the voltage-gated sodium channels, they give you a flash of fluorescence because they sit at one place and then give you all those photons from one place. All right? 
So uh, as time goes on, uh, uh, they're always diffusing, they're always binding, they're always coming to the surface, and every flash of light corresponds to the position of a voltage-gated sodium channel. Hmm. So <coughs> using that, we can admit to make images like this one. Uh, the, the cell body is off scale here, up off the screen, and this is a, a growth out of that cell body that's very much like an axon, all right? Uh, and uh, it's called a PC12 cell that's been made to differentiate. And using this paint idea, we can uh, tell you where all of these voltage-gated sodium channels are located with these little dots. And we can also do it as a function of time. So this is uh, a movie that has a, a time resolution of about a half a second. In other words, we're co combining together a whole bunch of these flashing images of little dots and so forth uh, to create uh, something that shows you every 500 milliseconds how it changes. Uh, and you can see little growths coming out from the cell, uh, neuritic growths that, that, mm -hmm. that grow and decay and so forth uh, as a function of time. So it's, it's, uh, it's got, even though it takes some time to record these images, you know, those <coughs> multiple frames that I kind of showed you, you still can get uh, some time information from this. Okay, so I, I've told you pretty much about uh, how super resolution works. And it's based on these individual molecules as tiny little light sources that are down inside and on the structure of, the, of interest. And they report back to you positions on that structure. And that's how you get the, the, the final uh, image uh, beyond the diffraction line. I want to I wanna sort of end up with uh, some, some sort of you know, comments and, 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 and lessons, if you like, that have come from all of this research over the years, and uh, hopefully for uh, uh, the young people in the audience. And you can also communicate this uh, to, your, to your own young friends. Uh, let me just start by showing you the back side of the Nobel medal. It's right here. You know, you know there's Nobel on the front, but on the back, there's nature holding a cornucopia. And uh, uh, science is lifting the veil of nature. Really a beautiful, beautiful uh, piece of artwork on the back side of the Nobel medal. So I want to say science is fun. That's really important thing to remember. We, we have a, a great time learning about these things and helping. And so uh, I want to encourage people to help lift this veil uh, of nature. Uh, find your passion is a very, very key aspect of this, of course, because you have to be uh, in, in really motivated in your heart to work and, and explore and learn new things. It's very essential, can be hard work at times. Of course, there's nothing wrong with hard work uh, when you get such benefits from it. Uh, but it, there's, a, there's a real need for being determined and persistent. I like to think of it all as asking how things work. How does the world work? How does this object work? How does your iPhone work? How do, how do, how do crystals work? How do cells work? Uh, how do uh, each of those amazing organisms that we saw today, how do they work? That's what drives us as scientists. To, to try to answer these questions. And, and in order to, to do it, you have to, of course, ask that question more and more deeply as time goes on, because you want to push beyond what people have, have thought before and, and were limited by. Uh, and of course, uh, science provides this rational and predictive way to understand our world. It's something that, that's a wonderful aspect of it. Um, I want to, uh, of course, uh, now have some acknowledgments. Uh, in addition to my wife, I want to, uh, of course, uh, acknowledge my group. This is the current uh, group of students at Stanford. We're getting ready for Halloween, and they are uh, all, um, uh, uh, you know, we're all dressed up, ready for them. And, and all of my work uh, depends tremendously upon all of these collaborators and, and colleagues that I've been working with for, for many, many years, and uh, the funding agencies, the NIH and the DOE, that support our research. And, and we call ourselves the guacamole team right, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, uh, something else that may be of interest to you, uh, we have a little logo. Uh, it's this one right here, no ensemble averaging. Okay. Uh, you know, single molecule spectroscopy, no ensemble averaging, and there's uh, you know, you can, uh, there's magnets, and uh, I'm not trying to sell anything to you because uh, I, there's no profits for any of this for, to me, but if you're interested in this, uh, this business, there's magnets, there's mugs, there's, you know, uh, here's a petty or whatever. <laughs> and uh, I hope that, hope that uh, this discussion has been uh, understandable, and I really do encourage questions. Do not be afraid to ask me questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
a bit of like something like you sequester some molecules and then you turn them on and off. But if I were to try to explain someone in words about your diagram, how you trick the diffraction limit and are able to visualize in a clear way, how would I put it in words? Yeah. Well, first of all, think about the fact that uh, these molecules do emit light. Okay, I, I showed you that molecules are fluorescent. Right. So just imagine that if, if there's a very low concentration of them, they look like big, tiny point sources, right? Little different <coughs> spots, different separated spots. Yeah. And because they're separated, I can find their positions very, very well. But th then you just want to add the concept that we, we place them all along the structure of interest, but don't allow them to all emit at the same time. Uh, we make sure that most of them are dark. Right. Uh, and that means that now there are individual light sources that will turn on a different. So they time. trace out the structure. They trace out the structure, and so you build up the picture. And we build up the picture from the positions we find of the individual. Yeah. How did you learn which molecules to look for in your first assessment? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it, it, uh, in 1989, uh, we were working on optical storage at IBM. We were working on using molecules to store bits. And we had the freedom to explore the scientific fundamentals of that idea. And it turned out that I, I became concerned about, a, 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 if you like, a noise source that might come from the finite number of molecules. And, and that's what got me going on, let's see if we can, can detect one. Okay. Mm. So, um, but in a, in a different sort of way, uh, this blinking business, this bit of molecules turning on and off and flashing at us like flashing lights, is something that we discovered just because we were exploring a new regime that hadn't been explored before. Mm -hmm. we, we did the first experiments to observe green fluorescent protein, okay, and by surprise, they were blinking on and off. And then we have to, of course, understand the mechanism for that, which was, which was something that was used like a little bit later. But it was really a discovery mode. Let's look in this new regime and see what we see. We saw surprises, and then we figured out how to use them later. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. How might this technology be used, um, or used, or it, or is being used mm -hmm. in for like medical applications or industrial applications, like? For, from our point of view, sort of the practical application mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I'm happy to explain that. Uh, so one, one area that we've been working in, um, I can show you a little bit of it right here, that has a medical application, uh, is in Huntington's disease. So Huntington's disease is a, uh, a difficult disease. It's hereditary. Uh, it late onset, it's a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, it's, it has all kinds of symptoms and so forth, but it's, it's coming from a particular region of a particular protein called Huntington, that's the name of the protein, which, uh, when there's a mutation in this, then Huntington proteins will aggregate. They'll stick together, and, and they will produce some extended structure, okay? And a lot of people are trying to figure out how does this happen, how does it work, what's driving it, how does it kill cells in the brain and all that. Um, so uh, these, these Huntington diseased brains have aggregates in them of the Huntington protein. So we're imaging those aggregates. Here's a diffraction limited image of, those, of some Huntington <coughs> protein aggregates where you see just a lot of fuzzy stuff. Uh, and then this is a super resolution image of that same, of that same structure. Uh, we can see the widths of them, we can see how large they are, we can characterize all kinds of parameters once you have this extra information. We also uh, validate our, our measurements with an atomic force microscopy. But it's just uh, showing that the, the optics is giving a good representation of what you would see. Look at the similarity between the painting behind you and that. It's now $50. <laughs> 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 what, what's the atomic force microscopy? Another way of, of well, it's it's a scheme where you bring a very very sharp tip down very very close to the object and, and have to use this nanoscale tip to move over the object and, and trace out its shape. But you you can't do that inside a cell. We actually have also done this inside cells now using the fact that light can penetrate and look inside easily. We see very similar structures inside the cell. So the answer is. 
there's, there's potential applications to uh, neurodegenerative diseases, but in, on a broader scale, every uh, thing that we learn about cell biology has relations to, of course, medical uh, uh, problems because we have to understand how cells work when they're not diseased as well as when they are diseased. So that there's just so much, the, the biggest impact is on the broad area of cell biology. Yeah, it would uh, assume if you can do this, that you can do things like, for example, now the tau protein is showing up more and more from brain damage to football players. Right. Mm -hmm. constant exactly right. That kind of thing. Um, okay, well, thank you very much. And we are going to give you... to hold and touch Pedro, and then we'll have a very quick question and answer session with both of us, and then a chance to meet Dr. Werner, and then the reception. So first, those of you who wanted to... Uh, uh, um, yeah, okay. and, and I think maybe since time is, is going along here, it might be more time efficient to, um, do, uh, while Pedro's moving, have Dr. Murner come up and together we will do any unanswered questions for either of us. And then you can meet Dr. Murner. So if you can come up here, Dr. Murner. And uh, because it looks like Pedro is going along on his own very well. So any questions uh, on anything you heard today about lizards, snakes, environment, or uh, the uh, lecture you just heard, or trophic test games, any of that. And uh, uh, any questions? <laughs> Are you, you, you were well, I, the question I, I didn't really catch how you did the, uh, the turning on a well, small subset of the molecules at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Is both the so there, there's, there's, it turns out there's a whole bunch of mechanisms uh -huh. to make the number be small. All right, that's the that's the point here. One of them is this paint idea that I've yeah, you. <laughs> With the paint idea, you just put a few in solution. You have fewer in solution, so fewer wines in surface, so there'll only be a few in any given moment. And you will have a solution. I didn't think that long. I was able to show you 500 milliseconds oh, at that time average. I know they, they can do these very fast. You get a lot of, a lot of flashing and um, The others have to do with sort of uh, internal properties of the molecules themselves. Uh, because some of these molecules, they, they have an emissive form, and then they have a dark form. And then if they can come back reversibly from that dark form and start emitting again, that makes them blink on and off. So you don't control that, that just sort of stochastic effect. Exactly right. But we do con what we do control that is, let's say, the laser intensity, which uh -huh. controls how fast you've got this dark state. And we also control the lifetime of the dark state. We can add some molecules that, that help the molecule be dark or more often, whatever. Okay. So sometimes people add uh, other molecules to the solution that makes the molecule white. Yeah, right. Exactly. So it, there, it's a whole bunch of mechanisms. Photoactivation is the final one, right? If you have molecules that are non fluorescent until you turn them on, then you just turn them on. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, sure. You had a question. I actually back to the thing you were talking about. It's a little bit confused. Like you had said that there's a study that studies that show that. Pardon me, pardon me. Can we have a little less talking so that people can hear the questions and the answers? Thank you. Um, you had said that there were a study that said that the wolves, that, that the protein that they were able to catch by working together was actually less than the, like the benefit of the group was the, right. as great as we thought. In terms of the amount of food each individual wolf right. gets, he has to share more. But what confuses me is the fact that many of the animals that they catch they could not catch individually, so I'm not sure how that's Well, possible. that's why they had the study where they found that at Isle Royal National Park in Michigan, 
they had lone wolves actually able to take down almost full-grown moose. Ah. So the pack needs to be there to do a full-grown moose, but 90% full-grown alone that wolves can still get it. Yeah. Okay. So it's, okay. they get more food per wolf. So the marginal benefit is as great as... Yeah. <laughs> more food per wolf when you consider sharing, unless you count the fact that ravens steal up to a third of the problem okay. either. Um, Dr. Morner, uh, you mentioned the individual molecules walking back and forth inside the, is it a bacterium cell that you were, but, or many um, cells probably? The best thing to think about for walking is, is in, in neural cells. Neural cell. Yeah, neurons. If you have a neuron that runs from your back down to your foot, about a meter long, and there are these little tiny kinesin motors, they're called, that walk from one end to the other, carrying vial of neurotransmitters. It's amazing. And so, uh, those, are, those are one of the things that people study. It's how these little motors work inside the Can you share some of the more fun observations of, uh, you know, either what they're walking with or what they're doing or, or anything that's kind of fun, anything, <laughs> some examples well, to me, of... To me, it's all fun. Yeah. <laughs> the fact you can see them is fun. The fact you can measure how fast they're moving. Sometimes they go forward and then stop. Sometimes they take a few steps back. Sometimes they then go forward again. And why are they moving forward? Why are they moving back? Why are they pausing? That's what people are studying. Mm. So and there's... Those things weren't observed before. You had single molecule studies. So that's... That's the kind of thing that we have to explore. So maybe there's a, a, a function of indecision at the cellular level? <laughs> it, it all has to do with, you know, really how they work on a molecular level. Exactly right. It's because they are they're little machines, and they may have more than one state. They may have a state where they're, you know, uh, going to move back, another state where they move forward. Did everyone get to Thank handle you. or touch Pedro who wants to? Yeah. Except for our speaker? You get a feel now of what they feel like okay, and yeah. how heavy they're pretty Why heavy. Why are you picking me up? If you want to see my tie. If you like my tie, you probably do. Probably can see color. So we had a, another question yes. here. Yeah, I mean, you developed the chemistry to allow, but, but the biology sounds like it's a little different. I mean, if someone wants to say, okay, now I can look at a neuron and I can see things are moving around in it, but, you know, what does that actually mean in terms of how, uh, uh, for instance, the neuron transmits uh, the information from one end of the neuron to the other at a certain rate of speed? I mean, I'm looking at the speed when, you're saying these things are walking, it seems like, wow, that's awful slow when I look at a guy getting a bat, you know, swinging a ball at a bat. The information is going a heck of a lot faster than that. And, and, and I, you know, the, so, one of, one of the, so don't be confused about this last business of the time scale. Yeah. It's very much like an assembly line. Okay. These little, these little uh, Canadian motors are carrying neurotransmitter, but you don't wave them and they carry one all the way to the other end and just have your nerve pod. Fire. There's millions of them all doing it all at the same time. Hmm. And you're living on the ones that are here down at the end of the yeah. synapse and they're ready to go immediately. But you depend upon the others coming in the next hour. Ooh, like a relay or something? Yeah. yeah. Ooh, that's a, now, that's a, that's a right. electrical depolarization. This is just to replenish the transmitter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. not really what it's different. Well, you know, yeah. the, the question you're asking about is there are many molecular level mechanisms that are active in different parts of, of cells. And, and we, we use these methods to take apart each one bit by bit by bit individually and then put them all together. So it, it requires breaking it down and looking at individual parts of the whole thing, whether it's depolarization like he's talking about or, or whatever. Okay, so that's the way to think about it. How? Uh, yeah, I'm done. Um, how is it that they get, the molecules get exhausted? If they go to the ground state, why can't a photon then excite them uh, infinitely in time? What happens to them? Great question. So um, we're, we're at room temperature, and uh, we are using light, of course, to pump the molecule. But remember, I, I sent in green. I didn't get back green. I got back orange or yellow. Some energy was left behind. 
Because mm. energy is going to be conserved no matter what. So it's that little energy left behind is a little bit of heat in, in the molecule. And apparently, and, then, and this actually is common in all, essentially all molecules, after a million times of doing it, that those extra little bits of heat each time finally increase the probability that you win the lottery and the, and the molecule breaks. A, a bond is broken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you don't have the original molecule. Right, right. that's what full bleaching normally means. Right. You lost the original molecule because you pumped it so many times that it changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think we uh, have had a great day. And um, I just want one little anecdote for you. There was a uh, very learned, well-known physicist who would give a lecture as to other physicists as he traveled around the country and the world, and his chauffeur would always be in the back of the room hearing the lecture hundreds of times till he said he could give the lecture. So he said, why don't I pretend to be you in the next stop, because they don't know what you look like or a way. You'll be the chauffeur at the back of the room. We'll play a little joke on him. So the physicist agreed to this, and the, the lecture was delivered very well by rote by the chauffeur. But then it became time for questions. And the physicist asked some questions with the chauffeur. Could, handled pretty well because he had listened so long and learned by rope, but then came a question that he absolutely couldn't answer because he hadn't heard before. So he said, well, you know, that question is so simple. That's so e My chauffeur at the back of the <laughs> <laughs> So, um, when I do these Darwin Days, do I pay the Nobel Prize winner who comes? No. No compensation, just on his own time donated <laughs> on the Nate Thank Darwin you. Day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Werner, for coming and sharing that with us and making Darwin Day. And what we want to do, what I'd like to do now, is even those who aren't going to the reception to have the opportunity to at least shake his hand and meet him. And um, then when after that, we will go to the reception in the other room, those who are going. But um, 